Dina, so today's video is a follow-up on last week's video. If you guys remember, last week we discussed the insides of a computer, and today we will be discussing the CPU, or the central processing unit, the computer's brain. So from last week, the CPU is the main brain of the computer, but to get where we are today, the CPU has gone through a series of evolution, and here is a closer look. Even though today we are just going to be discussing the CPU of a computer, many devices around us also have CPUs, such as our microwave or even our television. The first CPU dates back to 500 BC. Can you believe that? That's over 2,000 years ago. And the abacus is where it all began. The abacus was originally used for counting including addition and subtraction. Then we came to Pascal's calculator almost 2,000 years later, which was a refined abacus used by Pascal himself to help his taxman father add and subtract. This was the first stage of mathematics being done by a machine or a calculator. Next, we come to the actual first generation of CPUs which began in the late 1880s and continued on to 1954. With the dawn of electricity, elaborate computers were built. This here is an example of one of the computers from that time period. The ENIAC, or the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, is one such computer from 1946, shown here. It was the first programmable computer. As you can see, it took up a whole huge room. It had 17,000 vacuum tubes, 500 miles of wire, and took up 1,800 square feet. Today, that's larger than most New York City apartments. 36 vacuum tubes were used to store just one digit of data. Can you imagine that once upon a time, our little computer was this large that it filled up a whole room, almost as big as an apartment? That's huge. Now for the second generation. This second generation from 1951 to 1956 was based on the invention of the transistor. This was William Shockley's invention. He invented this in 1947 and he won the Nobel Prize in 1956. A transistor is a semiconductor device that is used to amplify and switch electronic signals. The IBM 608 was the first commercial computer in this generation. That computer is shown here, and as you can see, it's thankfully substantially smaller than our previous version. Our third generation comes in the form of an integrated circuit, or an IC. This generation was from 1959 to 1971. This meant that entire electronic circuits could be mounted on a piece of silicon. So here we have the silicon board, and right on top of that we have an electronic circuit which is our IC. An IC is now what we call a computer chip. This was created by Robert Noyce at Texas Instruments. This invention was truly revolutionary because it meant that that whole room of wires that we had could now be mounted on just one small board. The fourth generation brings us to the current. This generation spans from 1971 to now, and it comes with the invention of the microprocessor. Many examples can be seen here. This essentially meant that the entire CPU, all those wires, that whole machine could be mounted on just one piece of silicon, one board. Today, Intel dominates the desktop and laptop space. Unfortunately, though, they miss the bus on mobile devices and are scrambling to catch up. Today, there are so many different types of microprocessors, such as the one seen here. So now that we know exactly how the microprocessor came to be, let's talk a little bit about it. So what is a microprocessor? How does it work? And why should we care? So here we have a list of CPU specifications. So what exactly can your CPU do? There are examples of 4-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit controller. If you realize, these numbers are all powers of 2. This means that your computer can handle anywhere from 4 bits at a time of computations to 64 bits at a time. Bit 
the word is kind of a geek speak for binary digit. But why not bid, or even biddy, for symmetry? The first popular home computer seen here was the IBM PC, which housed the Intel 8088 processor, which had an 8-bit controller. Today, though, our computers are so much more advanced, and we've progressed to the 64-bit controller stage. Can you believe the progression? Today, if you were to buy a computer, you might see things such as dual-core or quad-core, turbo-boost or turbo-core. Dual-core and quad-core enable your CPU to perform multiple processes at the same time, or to solve one problem more efficiently through the use of multitasking. Dual core means two processes at the same time, and quad core means four processes at the same time. Turbo Boost, used by Intel, or Turbo Core, used by AMD, the other chip making company, means that when your CPU is running at full power, the CPU will get a boost of energy, meaning that it can run at a faster speed than normally specified. Here, we have a table that shows the evolution of the microprocessor. Let's go to the next slide to see what all these columns mean. The above chart that we just saw is a snapshot from Intel. The table tells you the name of the processor, when it was introduced, the number of transistors, which has increased exponentially over time, the width of the smallest wire on the chip, Note that the width is measured in microns, and one strand of human hair is 100 microns thick. Next, the table indicates the clock speed and the MIPS, millions of instructions per second. This measures the speed at which instructions are processed. One instruction could take multiple clock cycles. So now, going back, if we look at the Pentium processor, we can see that it was originally manufactured in 1993. There are 3.1 million transistors. Each wire is 0.8 microns thick. There is a clock speed of 60 megahertz. There is a data width of 32 bits or 64 bits. And 100 million instructions per second can be processed. Now, we will be taking a quick look at the CPU components. First, we have the arithmetic logic unit, or the ALU. This is where all the math that the CPU performs takes place. The CPU can send data from one memory location to another. It does this by passing on the address to memory using the address bus. The data bus sends and receives data to and from memory. A bus is nerd speak for a pipe that basically carries all the data that we send. Next, we have an RD line and a WR line. The RD line is used to read from memory, and the WR line is used to write from memory. These buses and lines connect to the ROM and RAM, the read-only memory and the random access memory, which we talked about in our last video. So that brings us to the end of our study of the CPU. I hope you enjoyed this video. From each Nerdina to all Nerdinas, adios.